Welcome to Oklahoma Family Retreat 2015. It's great to be here, and it's great to have all of you here. The place is already filling up tonight, and we want to welcome those of you that are with us by live stream tonight. And I'd like to second uh, Alfonso's prayer that the, the weather would be good, because I understand it's supposed to hail again tonight. So pray that the Lord uh, keeps that from happening. And I'm going casual tonight because we got here safely, which we're very thankful for, but our luggage did not arrive. Not one case. So when Ricky picked us up, we're standing on the curb with my briefcase. I said, yes, we're traveling light this year. <laughs> because our suitcases were all left in Atlanta. Always stuck in Atlanta. We used to fly on ASA once in a while, and we nicknamed it in the early years, we nicknamed it Always Stuck in Atlanta, because it seemed like we did get stuck there many times, but we're delighted to be here tonight, and we're looking forward to talking about skeletons in the closet. How do you like that title, huh? Kind of scary a little bit, maybe Bill, it, it drew your curiosity. I can remember when my husband and I, we were on a plane, we spent a lot of time sitting on airplanes, and we were talking about this year's family retreats and what we were going to do that would go along with our theme that nothing is very good. You've already learned that, right? So we've all got it, we can all go home because we've got it, right? Now we all need to keep this in the forefront of our thoughts. So as we were talking about different things we wanted to discuss here, this is something that came right to the forefront of our minds because this is an area that all of us deal with, putting things away, you know, out of sight, out of mind maybe, just kind of hide them and, and hope that we can go through life and not really have to deal with them. Well, we're going to open the closet doors tonight. That's not scary, right? <laughs> Now, it's only scary if we don't want to deal honestly. And we're here because all of us want to be honest with the Lord and with ourselves. And you can decide how honest you want to be with everybody else that's here. But tonight, we're going to talk about these skeletons that are in the closet because we all have things that are hidden or have had things that are hidden in the closet, things that we cannot talk about, things that we hope no one else will find out about, and in marriage, things that we try to avoid and keep tucked away because talking about them ends up creating problems or, you know, things don't turn out well. Things that we don't really want to admit or that we don't want to, that we don't want to face or that we fear what will happen if those things are exposed? Or we have the fear of failure, and I think all of us can identify with that. The fear of failure, therefore, if I just don't have to have it right in front of me, I don't have to have that fear of failure. But we're going to give you just a list. It's not exhaustive by any means. But just some of the things that we know, some, some of you and maybe more of you than, than we even realize are dealing with some of these areas, things that we have dealt with in our own lives and things we're going to be sharing with you that are very vulnerable and very honest and, and I say a little bit somehow raw and intimidating maybe. But these are some of the areas that we want you to think about because this is a very personal message. So for you adults, it's a very individual for you children. This is not excluding you at all because you children face some things too that you, that you don't want to deal with, that you don't want to have to admit to, weaknesses or problems or avoidances. So we're going to give you some ideas here, but we're praying that the Holy Spirit will bring to your mind the thing that he wants you to face here this evening and face and begin a new way of dealing with it through this retreat here. So some of the things that many of you may be dealing with are negative feelings. Negative feelings. And we, of course, the, the person in the scripture that came to my mind was Saul, King Saul. He had negative feelings, didn't he? 
So when we bring the Bible character in, we want you to also think where those skeletons end up for those people, okay? So where did Saul end up? You, you know, think of the story. And this is why we feel it's important that we face these skeletons. Samson did not face his lust, his sensual thoughts, his indiscretions with women. And we know where that ended him up. And we're thankful that eventually he was willing to deal with those things once his eyes were poked out. And because he was made blind, he eventually was made to see. And he's there in Hebrews 11. Isn't that good news? That's very encouraging because we can deal with these things. Bitterness is another area that many people struggle with. If there's anybody that comes to your mind that immediately brings a negative thought and negative feelings, even the, the physical feelings that come with bitterness that's held, this is the time God wants us to deal with those kind of feelings. Herodias had very bitter feelings. And we know what that led her to do and where, what that caused the life of John, what that caused the life of John the Baptist. Secret sin, vice, self-abuse, these are areas that can be deeply hid in the closet. Fear of being exposed, fear of what will happen if someone finds out, and they lead inevitably all these secret sins will not always remain secret, and they end up causing dysfunction in every relationship that we will have. Jealousy is another area. It's one of those things that we don't like to have to admit that we may have, but we have to open our hearts and ask God, Lord, am I holding a jealous attitude toward anyone? Cain was jealous of his brother. Because his brother's sacrifice was accepted, and his was not. He didn't like the fact that his brother's was accepted. It made him look bad. He wanted to justify himself. Those jealous feelings led him to take the life of his brother in a moment of passion and anger. And this is a story, and we could tell you many of the Bible stories, which you well know. But we often think that, oh, no, I would never do anything like this. But if we have these feelings and they're unchecked, if we have these sentiments, these thoughts, these emotions, and we just massage them, we justify them, whatever they are, they will not just be kept internally. They will grow and they will manifest themselves. The sin of pride, which is one that every human being struggles with, and inspiration tells us that spiritual pride is the most incurable of all the pride issues, and pride is just a fancy term for self-love. And so when it's candy-coated in religion, it makes it even harder. Jesus had a very difficult time reaching spiritual pride on the earth when he walked here among us. Greed is another area that people like to protect, hide, pretend like I'm, I'm generous, I'm helpful, I'm this, I'm that. But in the background, in the secret, they want to get more and more and more and more and more for themselves. Even to the point of doing things that will cause other people's uh, demise. That's the sin of greed. And the example of Balaam is another vivid example where Balaam was so driven by this kind of greed and avarice, covetousness, wanting for himself, he was willing to go to the point of talking to his donkey when his donkey talked to him. How's that for being so involved in your feelings that you'll actually have a conversation with a donkey and think nothing of it? Now, we think, well, that sounds kind of humorous and almost unbelievable, but it really happened. And the angel told him, if it hadn't been for your donkey, I would have killed you. So the donkey saved his life, but that shows you how far these kind of thoughts and feelings 
can lead us if we are unwilling to address them where they matter most in our hearts. Insecurity and addictions is another area. There may be some struggling here tonight with one or both of those areas. God wants to let us know that tonight it's possible to find victory in those things. You know, we think of addictions, we think of, you know, abuse, drug abuse, alcohol, but there's other kind of addictions. There's immoral addictions, there's food addictions, there's device addictions, there's entertainment addictions. It's what captivates us, what drives us, what, where we spend our time, how we think, the decisions we make are driven by our addictions. So we need to let the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, say, here's my closet door, Lord, open it. I'm ready for you to show me whatever it is that needs to come out and clean that that out and make me a whole person. Mary is the example we have from scripture about addiction. She had insecurities and addictions, and we know what the power of Jesus Christ did for her, don't we? No. And that should give every one of us hope, because there's nothing too hard for God. No matter how low we've been, what we've done, who we've hurt, what we've said, God will change our hearts. Another area that's very common and yet often unaddressed is insecurities. And insecurities is something that often gets pushed aside or downplayed. And it's interesting, as I just said this, it's not in the notes here, but there was a time in my experience, and my wife knows this very well when we were back in our medical professions, that it was nearly, well, it was very difficult for me to have face-to-face -face interactions with the doctors. I could do very well with the janitors. And my wife actually helped me identify this as an insecurity because I felt very comfortable talking. I'm just using the, the contrast here. I felt very comfortable talking with people who I considered of equal or lower estate than myself but I felt very uncomfortable talking to people who I thought were better than me. And my wife helped me identify this insecurity in where it came from. It actually came out of my freshman year in academy. I came, I came off of a farm. I was a farm boy, okay, which I was very happy to be a farm boy, okay? I loved living on a farm. But I came into a school outside of Detroit, Michigan that was not farm kids, an academy. And I tell you what I went through my freshman year in academy was devastating to my, you know, my self-dignity. I, I just, it was a, and I really never realized the damage it caused me until my wife helped me recognize this. And it's something I had to deal with. And it's something I still have to deal with at various times because insecurity can be a skeleton in the closet that we need the grace of God to deal with. And there is more. We're just, we just gave you a few little ones to kind of whet your appetite, stimulate your thinking, hopefully through the, the Lord opening some of those doors in your hearts because there may be one, more than one closet filled or there may be several skeletons in your closet. But when we started looking at our lives, because we really want to be ready when Jesus comes. We are looking forward to that. We love him. We are anticipating that great day. And we recognize that we can't be comfortable just because we have an understanding of a certain belief system or because of things that we do. But we want God to open up our hearts and reveal who we really are and what we really need to do to change to be more representative of him in all times and in all places. And I think that's why you're here too. And so we looked at our lives and we recognize there's two basic reasons why we lock these types of issues up in our closet. We call them the skeletons in the closet. Number one is we really don't want to have to give it up. I mean, we really kind of like those things. We really kind of like what we're viewing or we like what how this feels or we like this so we kind of just set it aside because we don't really want to face it 
Can I add something to that? Mm -hmm. In addition to that, not only is it sometimes we don't want to let it go, but sometimes it's easier to deal with the ruts we are comfortable with than to deal with the anxiety of trying to do something new that we're not comfortable with. And the second reason is that we have bought into the most effective deception Satan has ever done, has ever convinced man is that it is not possible to overcome. We've all bought into it. We've all listened to the lie. We've believed it. And because of that, we find ourselves still stuck in the ruts still hiding things, still locking things away, because we don't really trust that God has the power to overcome. Now, we can say we, we believe that, but we don't really allow it to happen and change us from within. So that's the other reason we found. Proverbs 15, verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are every place. Interesting thought, isn't it? The eyes of the Lord are how many places? In every. every place. Beholding the evil and the good. So we need to be honest. Let God have access to us. He's beholding everything. The evil and the good. And if we say we love God, and we say we want to serve him, and we say we want to live forever with him, it shouldn't be a great problem, <laughs> theoretically, for God to have access if he sees the evil and the good. And if he wants to access some of the evil that's stuck away in a closet, something we've excused, whatever it is, today is the day of salvation. This retreat is the time to let God have access to us. No more excuses. Whatever they are, however they're packaged, if God says, I need this, I want to take this, I want to, I want to give you complete victory, is it possible? Amen. Amen. So we should go away different than we came, right? So why are you really here? I guess maybe that's another question we put on our paper. Why are we here? Are we here because we've got friends and this is our time of year we come together, we can see each other and catch up on, on how life's been for each other and experience some new and good times together? Is that why you're here? Yeah, for some of you it may be. I hope it's not the only reason you're here. That's a good yeah, there's reason. There's nothing wrong with being here to That's right. That's a good reason, have but new it's friends not, or with it friends. shouldn't be the only reason. Some of you like to come to get inspired. Is that why you're here? You want to be inspired? Nobody wants to be inspired? Okay, I do. I go to eight of these a year. And I, I it, you know, it's been a blessing that, that God has given us the privilege to be in this ministry because he knows that we need it. What we share with you are things that God is sh sharing and showing us. And so we need to be encouraged and inspired and to see and, and experience the camaraderie of finding and climbing this what seemingly is impossible task that we can climb it and be victorious through Jesus Christ. And all along the journey, there's others around us that we can encourage and help or that might be helping us in the process. So we'd like to encourage all of us, because every time we share, we are encouraged. Right. Every time. It's not for you. It's for us. And so we want to plant the idea in all of our minds tonight, at the very beginning of this retreat, that we are expecting great things from God. And the only thing he expects from us in the process is our cooperation. God can do great things. He wants to do great things. There is nothing that's too hard for God. And every time I say that, I always think this thought, except me saying, no. 
Is that hard for God? <laughs> well, it complicates it when God is, God plays by fair rules, doesn't he? He knocks. The devil doesn't. You give a crack in the door to the devil, he plows in and does whatever damage he can do. God says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And so the only hard thing really for God in practical terms is when we say, no. I don't give you permission to have access to my heart. I won't give you permission to peek inside that closet, even though I know you see what's in there, but I don't want to deal with it. That's hard. Let's not make it hard for God when God longs to save us. So let's, let's be determined here beginning tonight, that we want God to have access to whatever he wants access to. Is that fair? Amen. Is that? Thank you. That's fair. <laughs> okay. So, if that's true, then we can say what David said in Psalm 139. Search me. In verse 23, search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Is that fair? Amen. Do we want God to do that? Yes. That's why we're here. Is it comfortable sometimes? No. <laughs> no. But God will do it. Nothing is impossible for God to do if we're willing for him to do it. So we want to look at the steps to deal with the skeletons, and then we're going to give you some real live examples of skeletons that have been in the process of being cleaned out, destroyed, and new, a new life being remade. So the first step here is to admit that we have a problem. The reason why we lock them away is because we don't really want to have to admit it. We want to pretend that they're going to go away. Or if I don't have to see it, then I don't have to deal with it, right? They don't go away. They linger there. And they usually don't linger isolated or alone. They usually start getting friends with them. Other areas that kind of go hand in hand. And pretty soon what started to be something that seemed small and insignificant begins to grow and grow and grow. And we use several examples of that from negative feelings and negative thoughts to jealousy, to bitterness, to anger, and even to slay someone. They grow, so we don't want them to grow. We must admit that we have a problem, and we have to stop. Oh, sorry. Sorry, can I just interject there? Oh, yeah, there? go ahead, anytime. In, in the, the idea of admitting that we have a problem, one of the, ble I'll, say, I'll say it, blessings, I was going to say one of the best things, one of the best blessings that we can experience is finding some accountability in someone we trust, in this case, my wife, okay? So, it's good to admit to God about the problem that God, you know, brings to our mind, but if you can admit it to someone else out loud, it's nice to have the extra accountability and especially I'm not speaking of some friend across the country. I'm talking about somebody, in this case, husband and wife, that it's already affecting this relationship. So admitting it, not only to God, acknowledging it, but also being willing to share that with your wife and have the prayer partner and accountability. Or share it with your parent or... That's right. Close, significant other. And the other, another aspect is we need to stop blaming others. In every one of the situations that we gave the illustration of where they had the negative result and these people, men and women, lost eternal life, they always had somebody else they could blame for the reason for their problem. If it's my problem, it's my problem and I need to deal with it as my problem, and not start looking for ways to make my husband the scapegoat for my issue. So we have to be willing to look inwardly and have accountability in our own heart. And then we need to believe 
that if God is bringing it to us, if we recognize that it's there, we have conviction, we have to believe that it is possible to change. Amen. Does that sound simple? It is possible to change. It is possible to teach an old dog new tricks. Right. Maybe hard, but it's possible. <laughs> and if God is in the equation, it will happen. That's right. It's already done. So our part is simply to be willing and surrender our heart to God. And even if we're not willing, we can ask God to make us willing. Lord, I see this in my life. I'm comfortable with it. That's who I am. That's what I've always thought. That's how I've always been. But I know when I read your word that this part of my life does not harmonize with your character. So, Lord, I, I give you permission to change my heart. Give me a new perspective. And he will do that. And, and I want to just emph emphasize the being willing to be made willing because that's not a play on words. Because I have experienced things in my life that I did not want to deal with, even though I clearly knew it was wrong. But I find myself resistant, and I said, Lord, I'm not willing, but I want to be made willing. I want you to do what you can do to change me. I'm willing to be changed. That's different than surrender. It's a type of surrender that says, I'm giving you access to me, but I can't change my heart. I don't even feel like changing my heart. I'm totally invested in this in selfishness. But I know it's wrong. It's leading me the wrong way. God, help me to be willing to change and give this away. He will do it. He will do it. And now that we've, we've come this far in the process, in these steps, we can trust that God is going to do it. He's going to answer our prayer, and how he does that is he's going to let us be confronted with the very thing we want to change. That's how God changes our hearts, because he confronts us with it and says, now is your opportunity to make a choice on how you want to deal with this. So don't think because you pray about it and you surrender it and you ask God to remove it from you that it's just all of a sudden all these negative thoughts or whatever the issues are are just going to just evaporate from you and it's never going to be a problem anymore. God is going to bring you into direct, head-on exposure to your issue. And he's going to give you the grace and give us the grace to say, I see it, Lord, right now. This is the moment that you want to begin that change that I've been praying for. And he will work through it with us. And the quicker we cooperate, the faster we hit these things face, for face on, the quicker we will see his mighty power to save. An important part of this, too, is being willing to... We talk about admitting that we're wrong, but in this process is being willing to verbalize to God, and if it's affected my wife or my children or someone, being willing to confess that as wrong, to own it. That what I did, whether it was in ignorance or whether it was in old habit or however it was, stubbornness, stubbornness I know that what I did was wrong. Please forgive me. There's healing in forgiveness, friends. Mm -hmm. We need to be forgiven. We need to, to own what we've done, to admit what we've done, to confess what we've done. If it's just between us and God, if it's secret sin, and it hasn't affected anybody else, it's between us and God. It has to be confessed and admitted. If it's affected someone else, it needs to be confessed not only to God, but to the person that it's affected, because we need his cleansing. We need his forgiveness. And it, it's a part of healing and going forward in the right direction. And I want to emphasize, when we pray for forget, to be forgiven, we, as Tom said, we need to accept and believe that, that we are forgiven. Because if we don't accept that forgiveness and we really believe that God loves us and forgives us, that won't go away. It will haunt us. 
and it will stay there. And the devil will, he knows just the right time to bring it back to the forefront of our thoughts when we're in a vulnerable position, in a weak position, and when those thoughts come, they tumble us down all over again. We get discouraged. We get, we feel we're never going to make it. And we start becoming what the devil is trying to convince us of is that just give up. It's never going to be any different. You're no good. You're, you're, you know, just forget it and just do what you want to do. And that's not where God wants us. I know from my own experience, things that, that I went through as a child that I carried guilt for for years, it wasn't until after I was married and it began to affect our relationship that I recognized my husband helped me to see because he would hear me pray, begging God, please forgive me. Well, honey, haven't you prayed that before? I know, but I don't feel it. You know, somehow the thoughts come back, the issues, the, the circumstances come to the forefront of the mind, and you feel all that junk all over again. No, I was forgiven when I asked for it to be forgiven. And when I believed it, the devil has never since, since I've accepted that, he's never found that avenue into my heart again. Yeah. I know that my Savior loves me, has forgiven me, and by faith I move on, and I'm no longer haunted and no longer distracted and no longer discouraged by the things of the past. We, we met a man recently when we were on our flight over to Australia, and it's a long flight for those of you that have done it, 15 hours and... So the person that was sitting in the third seat where we were sitting was an example of someone who heard the call that we are sharing together tonight. And he shared his experience with us, and it was a powerful testimony. A man who was very prominent, who was determined not to deal with the skeletons in the closet and how, just like these Bible characters that we shared at the beginning, how it began to play out and how it began to destroy his life and he lost everything. Everything. I lost, he said, I lost my home, I lost my job, I lost my wife, I lost my children. I lost everything and I found myself homeless in a car alone. Devastated, broken with God. God doesn't leave us or forsake us. God does not stop pursuing us. And he found God in that circumstance. And what a powerful testimony of the rebuilding power and grace of God in the life of that man. He just shared and shared about his love for Christ and the changes in his life. And it was, it was a beautiful story. Because finally, when he was at the bottom, or at least the bottom, as far down as he ever imagined he could go, it was at the bottom that he found the answers. And he came back to God, and God was there for him. And the amazing thing about his testimony, he didn't come back to God to get something. He came back to God because he knew that he needed God in his life. And he saw the kind of person he was without God and how he had pushed God out of his life in all these areas that drove him to the destitute uh, circumstances he was in. And he said, you know, you know I'm, and he's an attorney. He works for a, a major firm here in the United States, big business. And he said, you know, to, to come from just being able to have a toothbrush and, and being able to brush my teeth, that was like a wow for him because he lost everything that he had, but he found God in the process. And all he wanted was God. And when that became his focus in life, God took him and God has healed not only his heart, but it within just a few months placed him back as an, a, an attorney in another firm. And he's, you know, it's, it's phenomenal. He said, I could have never written the script. The job I have now is much different and better than what I had before because that's the awesome God we serve. He takes us where we are and he brings us to where he wants us to be. But we need to stay with him. So that's a very dramatic example. 
and we hope that no one here is, has had that quite that dramatic of a story, but we want to contrast that with something that is so simple and almost seems insignificant and almost seems silly to bring up, but we're going to share something that will help us to see how interested God is in our entire life and changing us because some of these things that we have tucked away in the closet for years are the root issue is pride of heart. It's, it's there. It's, it's at the bottom of it all. And that's what God really wants to root out of us is the pride of heart. So I'm going to share with you an example from my life that is very humbling, very vulnerable, and for many of you will think how elementary. But it was, it's a real thing for me. And it was just the end of last year that God said, okay, I'm going to open the door. I'm going to show you this in your life, and I want you to deal with it. And it was, I'm even shaking a little bit now, but it was quite a, a deal for me. Growing up, I was never a good reader. For whatever reason, I wasn't a good reader. I think it's because I never had phonics. But it was a handicap to me, and I can remember as a child, and maybe there's some of you who can remember your early school days, when we had to stand up in the classroom and we had to read out loud from the readers, that I would tremble because I was a bad reader. I was fearful. I was insecure. It was traumatizing to me. And I can remember taking the books, and maybe some of you read those same books. They were Dick and Jane books. You know, this is Dick. See, Dick, run, run, Dick, run, 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 run. I've got the books memorized because I had to do that because in class the teacher might call on me to read and I was fearful of it. I didn't know how to put words together. If they had more four or five letters, my mind would short circuit. And I didn't know if it was, you know, eight or at or whatever. I mean, you know, you got an E on the end. I finally learned teaching my children phonics and that was a tremendous help. But this is something that I carried through my early childhood. As I went further in education, I, I strove to do my best. Not because I was a good reader, but because I learned by listening and seeing what the teacher taught. So I was a child, my husband called me the apple polisher. I wasn't an apple polisher, I just wanted to learn. And I knew the only way I could learn was not to sit down and read the book, because I was so focused on just reading words, I had no concept of what I read. I just read words to get them right. So I would sit the very first chair under the teacher's nose in almost every single class so that I could learn. And I did well in school. And then I went on to nursing school, and we were given 60 to 80 to 100 pages a night of reading to do. And that is where it became very traumatic for me. Because I didn't have good reading skills, I didn't have good reading comprehension, and I can remember being for hours reading and rereading and rereading and praying that I would hear that, you know, the teacher would explain all these things before we got a test on it. Because sometimes they just give you a test on what you read, assuming that you were prepared for the class. So this carried on in my life. When we would go to church, I was never the one to raise a hand to read something out loud. Even if it was a scripture I knew by memory, it wouldn't be me who would be volunteering. I can remember going to prayer meeting and counting the paragraphs when it became my turn to read from the book. And, and totally blocking out what other people were saying because I was wanting to read to see if I could know all the words because it was stressful for me. And I've kept this hidden for years. And we were in the car together. We were riding to California to pick up my mother. She was visiting my brother. And we were doing devotions in the car. And I can read fine by myself. And I've grown in that silent reading. And I have better comprehension now when I read silently. But still, somehow when I have to read out loud, it's like it's all there again. And I focus on reading the words. And I don't get the meaning. So I'm reading out loud in the car to my husband. 
off the iPad, and I am butchering the words, making a mess. And he, I'd be reading along, and he'd say, oh, yeah, that's the word. I mean, it's like his mind is naturally filled in the word that I was supposed to be reading, but I was saying something different. And even in our marriage, I found it stressful. And at the moment, I shut the lid, and I said, I can't do this. I can't. This is too much for me. I was so insecure. And I started to find these feelings grow inside of me. And, you know, I didn't feel like he could understand me because he has a vocabulary, and he can say words. He did it on the way here. We looked at the same words on the side of the building, and I said it one way, and it made zero sense. And he said it, and it's like, oh, yeah, that sounds right. How did you know how to say that? He'd never seen or heard the word before because he, he's gifted this is not my gift. And I became insecure because there is pressure in life to, to be a certain standard, to be like other people out there, right? And when other people are superior to you, you feel inferior and you withdraw. And then you start, you know, looking for where their weakness is, right? Because we want to protect our weakness. And that day in the car, God wrote, got right to the bottom of the issue my heart. He said, you're worried about what other people are going to think of you. That's why you won't read out loud. You're worried that you're going to look illiterate. You're worried that you're going to look stupid, that you're going to say the wrong things. And he was exactly right. And I started to weep. And my husband was just like, what's happening? He said, honey, this is an area God wants you to deal with. And I want to help you. Because you are smart. You aren't stupid. But those are the lies I, be, I had taken up and believed for years because I couldn't do it like other people can do it. You have those same things in your life. Because we're not all the same. You have strengths that, you know, shine. And you've got weaknesses that you protect because they don't measure up to somebody else. And you don't want them to think that you aren't there. You know what I mean? So my husband said to me, honey, I've heard you read before and you do a good job. It's okay if you miss a word. I'm more interested in having you read and pay attention with what you're reading. You know, try to get the, you know, the meaning instead of just reading the words, however slow that is. And so in our home, for worship, I'm the out loud reader. Not every day and not every worship. But I think I'm improving. Amen. <laughs> Doing great, dear. Thanks. <laughs> but the real issue isn't reading. The real issue isn't my lack of ability in reading. The real issue is how it affected me, how I viewed myself, how I viewed others because I wasn't at their level. You get the point, right? This is what the skeletons are in our closets that God wants to dig out. He wants us to face them. He wants us to know that there is nothing impossible with him. Nothing. And even though I still may make mistakes, and I will make mistakes because there's awfully big words. I have no idea how to start them out or how to finish them up. It's okay. It's okay because it's not about me. It's about me choosing to do what God is asking me to do. Yes, and she's doing great. Thank you, dear. <laughs> but, and again, I want to emphasize the point here. Whatever it is we're dealing with, in this case, my wife is viewing this completely differently now. And we're working together on this. And I've never felt like she's a bad reader. That's been in her mind Decades. For decades, but now it's come out, and we can talk about it, we can share, I can be encouraging to her, how we respond to, a, to somebody bringing something out of the closet, even if it's a, you know, if it's a teenager or if it's a five-year-old, and they hear what we're talking about tonight, and they want to start sharing, don't shut them down, don't say, you shouldn't be thinking thoughts like that, you shouldn't do that, what? that shuts somebody down who's come under the conviction that I want to deal with the skeleton. Will you help me? That's what God wants us to do, is to open our hearts up to him Amen. and to each other. Okay? I like this verse, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. 
For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Now we read another verse earlier in the message. Looking, his eyes are everywhere, seeing the good and the evil. This says, to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. Okay, this is not talking about perfect people here. This is talking about people who are willing to open our hearts to God and say, do with me as you need to do with me, change me. And he is looking over this congregation tonight and he says, I will show myself strong for any of you whose heart turns to me tonight to deal with your skeleton in the closet. There were two classic examples in the New Testament. Two men that were very similar, two men that had similar weaknesses, similar characters. One of them was John, the beloved, one of the sons of thunder. The other was Judas. They started out very similarly in the weaknesses that they had, but one of them was willing for God to change him. And he ended up being the one who wrote the beautiful love story of our Heavenly Father and Christ our Savior. Because by beholding that, John became changed. Judas, on the other hand, made excuses, looked for ways to change the context of situations, and ended up hanging himself in desperation. Very poignant examples of two very different ends to the skeletons that were in the closets. And I just pray that for each one of us, whatever it is, only the Lord knows, maybe your wife knows, maybe your husband knows, maybe mom and dad know, your children know about you, mom and dad, whatever it is, only, only those that know, we don't know, but God knows and God wants to make a difference in your life before you leave this place. He wants to make a difference in all of us. And so tonight, as we close... We want to look at the words of Matthew 19, 26. Jesus said with men, this is impossible. It is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so we're going to close in prayer. And then we'd like you to take a few moments as the piano quietly plays. Meditative, thoughtful moments for you to reflect maybe not on everything, but what's the Lord bringing to your heart that he wants to deal with? Because he doesn't dump everything on us. He doesn't open the door and drag everything out of the closet at once. He doesn't overwhelm us. He loves us with an everlasting love. So as we, as we kneel together and pray, we'll follow it with a few moments of thoughtful reflection on what God is targeting for us. And we want you to write that thought down on the, the pamphlet you were given. Because that is your key point that you're coming away from this message with tonight. And each message, there should be at least one key point that the Lord is calling to your heart. That he wants to change, wants to help us to grow more like him. So let's kneel together as far as possible as we pray. Father in heaven. Thank you for being a tender father, a loving father. A father pursues us because you do love us with an everlasting love. And thank you for the possibilities of change because we, we believe that with you nothing is impossible. So tonight as we, as we close this message, we pray that you will work in each of our hearts. You know what we need better than we do. Pray that we would not resist you, that your will would be ultimately done, that our lives would be transformed by grace. In Jesus' name, amen.